praise you. We praise you because you are holy. You are holy. You are set apart. There is nothing and no one like you. And in your holiness, you have revealed to us that you are rich in love, that you are slow to anger, that you are abounding in mercy and grace for sinners like us. And so this morning, we just want our hearts to rise up to you, God. We just want it to be easy to praise you because we've seen how good you are. We've seen your beauty. We've seen all that you've done for us in your son, Jesus. We've known the presence and power of your Holy Spirit with us. And as we're just wrapped up, God, as we're just wrapped up in all the wonder of who you are, that we would just sort of melt into your arms. God, you are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy that every time we sing, we would just sing a little louder. That every time we praise you, we just praise a little truer. God, that our hearts would move little by little by little to see you for who you really are, to love you for all that you're worth. God, we pray that you would use your word mightily in our hearts today. God, would you pierce us? Would your word take root in us? Would it rearrange the ways that we have misunderstood you? And would you lead us to worship your son, Jesus? God, we bow humbly before your word. We long to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name that we worship and pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're taking your seat, I just want to invite you to go ahead and open up to Psalm 103, Psalm 103 this morning that you've already heard read. Guys, uh, I'm going to be honest. <clears throat> Uh, we've got really, really, really good news this morning. You know, sometimes in life, um, what I need, what you need, what we need is for God to just show up and change the subject. You know, I'm sure we could all, if we got together, we kind of pulled together, we could probably make a really, really long list of all the things that aren't going well. We could probably come up with a lot of reasons to have despair, to be disappointed, to be frustrated, to not be content. And what God is going to do here this morning through Psalm 103 is he's just going to walk up to us and he's going to change the channel. He's going to change the channel to all of the good and wonderful things that he has for us in and through his son, Jesus Christ. This psalm's good news, and it teaches us what real Christianity is. It teaches us what real Christianity is, and we need to hear that. We need to hear that. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you need to hear what true Christianity is. And if you are here this morning and you are a Christian, you need to hear what true Christianity is as well. And this is why. Because there are lots of counterfeits out there to Christianity. There are lots of imposters to the real thing. Uh, here's a few of those um, counterfeit versions of Christianity. Uh, one is that God is someone that I must please with my good behavior. That God's up in heaven, and for each one of our lives, he's got this little tally sheet. And on one side, it says good, and on one side, it says bad. And for every good thing we do, God puts a little tally on our name. And for every bad thing we do, God puts a little tally in our name. And then the goal of life is to get to the end there and to have more good tallies on our chart than bad tallies on our chart. That is counterfeit Christianity. Uh, another one of those false stories, false Christianities, is that, hey, we all just need to love each other. Now, certainly we do, right? But who defines what love really is? And how could loving one another reconcile us to a God whom we have rebelled against, a God whom we have offended, a God who we are called to love with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we all know that we have fallen short of. So just we all just need to love each other. That's a counterfeit Christianity. Uh, another, which is especially prominent in the South, is that I am blessed because I was born in the USA. Football, family, and God, y'all. Did I accidentally put those in the right order? This is a counterfeit Christianity. And a final false Christianity is, believe, is to believe that Christianity is a lifestyle I live to be blessed. 
And this can look like a number of different things. One of the ways this works out is that we think that what God wants for our lives now is for us to be healthy, for us to be wealthy, and for us to be prosperous. That if we just show up to church on Sunday, put something in the offering basket, then God's job is to help me succeed in life. But it can also look like this. It can also look like thinking that what God wants from us is to just live this secluded lifestyle. That if I just keep me and my family as far away from all the bad, evil stuff out there in the world, that we'll have peace and that we'll have security as a family and that God will bless us. This is a counterfeit Christianity. Christianity is not a lifestyle we live to be blessed, no matter what that lifestyle is. Uh, here, here's a way to think about what happens so often. So you'll notice that in each of these stories, little stories I've told, there actually is a little grain of truth in each of them. But what, what we do is we actually pick up just one piece of the puzzle, right? you got this big puzzle with all these pieces, and we just sort of pick up one piece of the puzzle, and we try to turn that into the entire puzzle. So what do we need to do? Well, sometimes what we need to do is we just need to step back, and we need to see the full picture again. And that's exactly what Psalm 103 does for us. Psalm 103 paints a grand vision of what true Christianity really is. And this is what Psalm 103 t t teaches us. This is true Christianity. Consuming worship of God in response to compelling grace from God. This is true Christianity. Consuming worship of God in response to compelling grace from God. So you got Psalm 103 open there. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at six defining characteristics of true Christianity. Six defining characteristics of true Christianity. The first is this. Our faith is all-consuming. Our faith is all-consuming. Verse 1 starts out saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Uh, this psalm we learn at the, at the top there is the psalm of David, and it begins and ends with David talking to himself. Now, I think if we're honest, you probably talk to yourself more than you want to believe. The other day, I uh, knocked my coffee over on somebody else's desk. Coffee starts running all over their stuff, and I immediately started preaching a little sermon to myself. You idiot! Why did you do that? Oh, why is this happening to me today, right? And I, I, I don't follow you around everywhere you go, but I would bet that you talk to yourself more than you think that you do. So what is David saying to himself? David is telling himself to bless the Lord. To bless God is to set him apart as the highest admiration in our hearts. Uh, we all have favorites, right? We have favorite teams. Uh, we have favorite, favorite uh, ice cream flavors. We have favorite movies. To bless God is to declare him as our favorite. It's for him to take the top spot in our life. But David understands true Christianity, and that's why he adds this phrase, and all that is within me. David wants his whole life to be consumed with setting apart God as having the highest admiration. David wants every single part of his life to declare God is my favorite. As we're going to see this morning, as we move forward, that because of who God is, and because of what God has done for us, Christianity is always all-consuming. Christianity grips and takes hold of the entirety of our lives. Uh, see, there's actually some things in life that you can't do with only part of yourself. So here, here's a few examples. You cannot skydive with only a part of yourself. You're either in or you're out. 
Can't be both. Another thing you can't do with only part of yourself is swim. Right? If the only thing in the water are your feet, that's not swimming. That's just dipping your toes in. Uh, another thing you can't do with only part of yourself is get married. Yeah, it's sort of an all-in kind of thing. You're either all-in or you're not in at all. What we're going to see this morning as we work through Psalm 103, Christianity is actually not something that we can only do with part of ourselves. Christianity actually can't just be the little side garnish on our already really full plate. Christianity can't be the little fairy dust that we sprinkle on our life that we've already sort of planned and got all of our arrangements for. When Christianity comes in, when God in his grace comes in, it takes up all of who we are. So the question we would ask is this. If this is really what true Christianity is, if this is what it demands, why would we sign up for this? And so the second defining characteristic of true Christianity is this. Our message is good news. Our message is good news. Verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, I don't know what we've heard about Christianity. I don't know what you think you heard. I don't know what your grandma taught you or what you see on Facebook about Christianity. Christianity is a message of good news. This psalm offers outrageous benefits to people who do not deserve them. And we, even those of us who are Christians, need to be reminded over and over and over of what these benefits are. John Owen said this. John Owen said, Our greatest hindrance in the Christian life is not our lack of effort, but our lack of acquaintance with our privileges. What does he mean by that? He means that if an all-consuming faith seems ridiculous, if offering up everything we are to God seems radical, if selling it all to follow Jesus seems unrealistic, then we actually just don't understand all that we're being offered. David immediately mentions five of these benefits. Remember, he's talking to himself, okay? He's talking to himself, and he says, Forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Have you ever heard better news than that? Yes, Guys, Christianity, true Christianity, it might actually just be better than we thought. It might be better than we thought. I bet some of you, many of you know this, uh, if you live in the city of Myrtle Beach, that comes with certain benefits, comes with certain advantages. Uh, one of those benefits, for example, is if you live in the city of Myrtle Beach, you can get a parking decal to go on your car so that whenever, in any, anywhere in town, you pull into a metered parking spot, you don't have to pay to park if you've got that little sticker on your car. What that means is that for those of us who don't live in the city of Myrtle Beach, if we want to go enjoy a nice little afternoon, eat a little lunch on the beach, and go ride on the Skywheel, we're going to drop about 100 bucks in parking just to enjoy our own beach. But here's the deal. Those of you who have that parking decal... It wasn't actually free. It's a benefit, but you paid for it. I would love to have the decal, 
but I sure am glad I don't have to pay those city taxes. It's a benefit, but it's a benefit that you pay for. Guys, in Christianity, God offers us the benefits, and it's his own son who pays for them. Our message is not do more good things than bad things and God will be pleased with you. Our message is not that, hey, we just all need to love each other. Our message is not, hey, if we can just learn to live the right lifestyle, then God will bless us. True Christianity, the good news that is the core of everything we believe is that it is because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we receive over and abundant benefits that so far exceed anything we could imagine. That is the message of Christianity. Amen. So, so, so he said, in every situation, right? In every situation we find ourselves in, in every circumstance that, that I find myself in, forget not all his benefits. I'm a sinner, we say. But God replies, have I mentioned that I forgive all your sin? I'm sick, we say. But God replies, have I mentioned that I will heal all your diseases? I'm dying, God. I'm in the pit. I'm on my deathbed. And He replies, have I mentioned that I raise the dead? I am poor and destitute. I, I don't have what I need. God replies, have I mentioned that I crowned you with the riches of my mercy and my love? I say, God, I'm so empty. I'm so dry. Have I mentioned that I satisfy your heart with endlessly good things forever and ever and ever? I think John Owen was right when he said that our greatest hindrance in the Christian life is not our lack of effort, but our lack of acquaintance with our privileges. Here's what happens so many times in the Christian life. Here's what can happen. We already have the parking decal on our car, and yet we pull into the spot and we still pay. In other words, God has already forgiven us, and yet we're still beating ourselves up for all the mistakes that we've made in our life. God has already washed us clean in his son, Jesus Christ, and yet we are frantically trying to scrub the stain out. Right? So many of the fears, so much of the striving that comes in the Christian life is that we actually don't enjoy what God has freely given us in his son, Jesus Christ. We can't enjoy what God has already promised to give us. And so we strive and we fret and we wonder, we question, when all the while, we've already got the benefits. All right, but it isn't just the benefits that David is calling his heart to rejoice, right? That's a, that's a good first step. Bless the Lord on my soul for getting all those benefits. But as we'll see, these benefits that are so good, these benefits that are so good flow out from a God who is so good. And so third, the third defining characteristic of Christianity is that our God is a perfect father. Our God is a perfect father. Uh, I want you to just take a second and think, what, what makes for a good dad? What makes for a good father? What makes for a father who knows how to care for his children, who knows how to love his children? What we're going to see as we, as we look through verses 6 to 14 is that David is going to go point by point by point, and he is going to check every single box of what it means for God to be our Father. And, and as he checks them, what we're going to see is that he, it, it's actually better than we thought. In verse 6, let's start there. David writes, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. As our perfect father, we can know that God will always do what is right. And if, if he always does what is right, it means that he will settle every score. Guys, our father, he has our backs. 
Uh, every one of us in this room have had moments in life where we've been taken advantage of. Every single one of us in this room have been mistreated. And the hard thing about it is most of the time there's nothing we can do about it. So many times we, we, we feel stuck. We feel like there's nowhere to turn. What this psalm is promising us is that if God is our Father, He will make it all right. That for us to let go of getting vengeance in ourselves isn't actually to let go of getting justice. To let go of vengeance in ourselves is to entrust our souls to our Father who has said, I will work righteousness and justice on your behalf. And then in verses 7 and 8, David writes this. He says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Guys, one of the worst counterfeit versions of God is that he is exacting, that he is quick to anger, and that he is abounding in displeasure. It's like we take what is actually the worst characteristics in a father to be demanding, to be overly harsh, to be constantly critical, to be hot-tempered. And we think that that's somehow what God is like. But over and over and over and over, the Bible teaches us, no, 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 no. God is slow to anger. Here's the problem with believing that God is quick to anger to be, and believing that God is hot-tempered. You and I actually avoid people who are quick to anger. And we especially avoid them when we have made a mistake. And so what can happen is if we believe that God is hot-tempered, quick to anger, then we actually end up avoiding the very one who we actually need in that moment. Yes, maybe we have sinned against him. Maybe we have turned our backs on him. But he's the only one who can actually forgive us. And so because we miscalculate and we think that he is quick to anger, that he's hot-tempered, that he's exacting and demanding, we avoid him when in reality he is the very one who we ought to be running towards. And then in verses 9 and 10, David gets really clear about who God is not about who God is not. He says he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Here's the hardest truth of all for us to believe and for us to really live in. It is that God does not deal with us according to our sins. You know why we have such a hard time with that? It's because it is so unlike us. We are so quick to treat people in our lives according to their sins. We most naturally evaluate others based upon their performance. Um, Allie and I lately have been watching some reruns of this show, America's Got Talent. Uh, these contestants, they come up on stage and they begin to perform and there's these judges and right in front of all the judges is this red button. And if they press that red button, a big, a loud buzzer goes off and a big red X pops up over the person's head in the middle of their performance. Now, here's what I fear. I fear that so many of us view our relationship to God that way. Like, like we're on a stage that we have to perform, and as soon as we step out of line, as soon as we do one thing that, that he doesn't like or one thing that doesn't please him, bam, he presses the button, and we hear the X, and the only thing that can go through our mind is, I'm this close to being kicked off of the stage. But here David comes in, and he says, no, no, no. Our perfect father, he does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. Why? Because the Christian life is not a performance. You 
Here's what this means. There will be people who did a lot better at life than you did, who helped a lot more people than you, who made a lot less big mistakes than you, who actually won't end up in heaven. And there will be people a lot worse than you. People that did things that you could not even imagine doing who will be seated right beside you at God's table in heaven. Our perfect Father does not deal with us according to our sins. Why is that? Why can this God, who is infinitely just, who we're trusting to be righteous, who we're trusting to be a just judge, how is it that he can not deal with us according to our sins? Well, David answers the question in verses 11 and 12. He says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The reason that God does not deal with us according to our sins is because he has detached them from us. God will not repay us for that which he has removed from us. This phrase, as far as the east is from the west, it's trying to communicate that if this is you and this is your sins, God has separated them as far from each other as is humanly possible. They are infinitely separated, never to rejoin again. But then we have to ask, but where did they go? Where did God put them? Uh, See, forgiveness always, always, always comes with a cost. Someone always ends up paying in forgiveness. Uh, Think, for example, if someone came into your house and stole from you, stole a bunch of items out of your house, Turn around the next day, they sold them off, never to be returned again. And then you caught that person. You have two legitimate options. First option is, you make them pay for it. Second option is, you forgive them. But, if you forgive them, you end up paying for what they took from you. Someone always pays in forgiveness. And so where did our sins go when God removed them from us as far as the east is from the west? He placed them upon his own son, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says this very clearly. He, talking about Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west because they were put on Jesus and Jesus was punished in our place. God does not deal with us according to our sins because he dealt with Jesus according to our sins in our place. You know, I deserve to be repaid for my transgressions. I deserve to be dealt with as if I was living life as a performance. But Praise God. Our perfect Father gave us His perfect Son to die in our place. See, it's not just that you and I need to become acquainted with the benefits that we have in Christ. We also need to feel the weight of what it cost for us to receive those benefits. Isaac Watts, in one of his famous hymns, I think he got at this very precisely. 
This is how he says it. He says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. What is he saying? He's saying, when I look at the cross, when I see what it took for a rebel like me to be brought into God's family, when I look at the cross and when I see what it took for God to remove my sins from me as far as the east is from the west, when I look at the cross, how could I possibly boast? How could I possibly have any pride in what I've done or any pride in the idea that I'm somehow better than someone else when I'm standing here in front of this cross, when I survey the wondrous cross? Our Father, our perfect Father, He has separated our sins from us, but it was at the cost of His own Son. And we need to feel, feel the weight of that. Then in verses 13 to 14, David really sets the context for this whole image of how we're to think about God as our Father. He says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For, this is important, he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. We tend to think that God helps those who help themselves. We tend to think that life is about the survival of the fittest. We tend to think that God is proud of strong people and that he's annoyed with weak people. But here, David is just blowing that out of the water. And he's saying, actually, actually, it is our weakness, it is the fact that we are but dust, it is our frailty that actually draws out the heart of compassion from God to us. Um, earlier this year, Allie took our son Benjamin over to a friend's house who has a pool in the backyard. And she was inside talking to the other woman, and all of a sudden, she hears a splash. So Allie comes running outside, and, and listen, uh, our son Benjamin, he's, he's three and a half. Uh, we've, you know, we've taken him in the water, but I assure you, he still needs the floaties, all right? He's not swimming by himself by any stretch of the imagination. And so Allie jumps in after him. Mind you, she's like eight months pregnant at the time. Now listen, if Allie had heard a splash and then seeing that it was me who fell in the pool, she would have come running out just as fast, except she would have been laughing at me instead of jumping in the pool after me. Why is that? It's because she knows our son. She knows his weakness. She knows that he can't swim, and because he can't swim, she jumped in after him. It was his weakness that drew the compassionate, rescuing heart out of her, whereas it, it would have been my strength that would have made her laugh and mock and joke at the mistake I had made. Guys, rather than our weaknesses disqualifying us from God's family, rather than our neediness being what keeps us away from God, rather it might just be the opposite. It might be that our weaknesses are what draws him to us. It is that he remembers that we are but dust that draws out his loving fatherly heart of compassion. Our Need for him is what draws his compassion and rescue out of him towards us, not the other way around. So what has David done? <laughs> He's gone point by point by point by point. He has told us every single characteristic of a good father. And what he showed us is that God is actually better. God actually exceeds every single characteristic of what it means to be a good dad. And so guys, this is for us. This means that when you and I talk about pursuing a relationship with God, when we talk about spending time with Him, we don't press having a relationship with God so that we can somehow get on His good side. No, we press having a relationship with Him. We press knowing God because He's the best person to know. We press into intimacy with Him because He is our favorite. But I think it leads to another question. 
An important question. When God becomes my father, is it possible for me to fall out of that relationship? And that's where David goes next. Our fourth defining characteristic this morning is that our foundation is unshakable. Our foundation is unshakable. Verses 15 through 18 present a contrast, okay? So David's going to show us a a stark contrast between two things. Uh, Let's read it. He says, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant, And remember to do his commandments. The contrast here in verses 15 to 18 is between the life of man and the love of God. So what does David have to say about the life of man? Well, David has to say that our life sprouts up. There's a little twinkling moment of glory and then poof, the wind blows and we're gone. And he sticks the knife in when he says, its place knows it no more. In other words, do you even know who your great-grandparents were? Do you know their names? Do you know what jobs they had? Do you know if they had pets or not? Do you know what kind of grades they got in school? Do you even know if they went to school? Guys, the life of man might be a blip, a blip of flourishing, but just like the flower of the field, Poof, the wind blows, and it's gone, and here, here's reality. <laughs> for, for all of us in this room, in a few years, we will be totally forgotten. No one will remember that we even lived, much less care what kind of grades we got or how much money we had or what kind of job we worked. So why does he say all this? Well, he says all this to contrast it with the love of God. God's love is not like the grass. It's not something that sprouts up today, but then gets cut down tomorrow. God's love is not like the flower of the field. It it doesn't have just this moment of flourishing and then poof, gone. God's love, he says, is from everlasting to everlasting. And that means, guys, that means that nothing, nothing, nothing can pluck us out of his hands. Here's the implication, okay? Here's the implication. If we put our hope in the things of this world, if we try to go at life without God, then the best we can do, the absolute best that we can do is to achieve grass flower glory. Pops up for a second, gone. That's the best we can do. But, 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 if our lives are anchored in his love, in the kind of love that where we cannot be snatched out of his hand, and the kind of love that is from everlasting to everlasting, then here's the truth, here's the reality. The world, the whole world can reject us. We could literally fail at every single thing that we put our hand to. But if we are rooted in the love of God, then we are rooted in something that is absolutely unshakable. While the whole world might forget us, we will be known by the only one that it matters to be known by. Now, With God as our Father, we're rooted, we're secure, we're grounded, we're safe, we're in His hands. All this other craziness can go on around us, live, die, poof, but we're in Him, so we're safe. But it also means one other really important thing for how we live our lives, okay? And so the fifth defining characteristic of true Christianity is this. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Verse 19 says this. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. This is what this means. Anyone that has God as their father belongs to his kingdom, and his throne is seated in heaven, which means that our citizenship is a citizenship of heaven. The first thing we have to acknowledge is that the way that you and I come to enjoy the benefits of this good news that we've been talking about this morning— the way that you and I enter in to this everlasting love of God 
is by becoming a part of God's kingdom. The Apostle Paul sort of ties a lot of these threads together in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. This is what he says. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So here we see that we're given a Father. We're given an inheritance. We are given redemption. We are given forgiveness. Where? Where is all of this located? It's located in within the kingdom of his son. If you're here this morning and you know, you know that you need your sins forgiven. If you're here this morning and you are realizing that your life is extremely fragile, that you have lived a forgettable life. If you are here this morning and the domain of darkness is all that has ever penetrated your life, you are being invited to submit to King Jesus this morning. And if you submit to King Jesus, then all of the benefits of the kingdom are yours. But then what does this mean for how we live our lives? For those of us who are in the kingdom, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a part of his kingdom? What it means is that our true home is in God's heavenly kingdom not where we are right now. What it means is that you and I are simply passing through. We are simply passing through. The Bible uses this word to describe us, that we are sojourners. Sojourners are people who go somewhere, but they're not planning to stay. They go to a place, but they are not planning to settle down. They are simply passing through. Now, I've never been a sojourner, uh, but I have come home from work. And an hour later, I'm still wearing my shoes and I still have my book bag on. And Allie walks up to me and she says, "Uh, are you planning to stay? Why does she do that? Why does she ask that? The reason why is there is a posture for staying and there is a posture for just passing through. There is a way that we think and we live and we make decisions if we're putting roots down, if we're settling in, and there's a way that we think and we plan and we make decisions and we live if we're just passing through, if we're just a visitor. And what A core, a core aspect of Christianity is that you and I are simply passing through. This is not our home. This is why a number of the counterfeit Christianities that we talked about at the beginning cannot be true. Guys, it cannot be true that what Christianity is, is to be born in the USA. That cannot be true. God's kingdom is not of this world. There is no one nation on the planet that is more a part of God's eternal kingdom than another. Listen, we are living in a day when there are countries that have more Christians in them than there are Christians in the United States. And those people are more our brothers and sisters in Christ than the people who live on our street. True Christianity is transnational, it is global, it is heavenly. And it means that it has our allegiance. It has our hearts. But it also means that this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel stuff, that it's a bunch of garbage as well. See, there's a nugget of truth in this. We've been talking about this morning. I mean, the, the blessings are endless. Heal all your diseases. Redeem your life from the pit. Crown you with love and mercy. I mean, the benefits are, whoa, The problem is, too many of us think that God owes them to us now, and we're not willing to patiently wait on his timing. As Jesus, he's seated at the right hand of God. He was resurrected from the dead and is is in glory, but 
he first died on the cross. And he told us that the citizens of his kingdom, guess what? They're going to get resurrected too. We're going to be seated in glory too. But just like him, first, 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 we take up our cross. We've got our backpacks on. We're still wearing our shoes. This is not our home. We're passing through, and what we're passing through too, it's so much better. It's so much better. And that's why lastly this morning, lastly, lastly, last defining characteristic of true Christianity is that our response, our response is genuine worship. Our response is genuine worship. This psalm both begins and ends with this call to bless the Lord, to bless the Lord, to set him apart as highest admiration, to declare beyond and everywhere that God is our favorite. And all throughout the middle, there's been reason after reason after reason after reason that, that to bless God, to worship him, it's the only thing that makes sense. And that's why here in verses 20 to 22, David finishes the psalm saying, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's like in light of how good God is, in light of what God has given us in his kingdom, in light of what God has given us through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, it's like David points to the angels and he's like, yo, angels, have you seen how good God is? You ought to bless the Lord. And then it's like he looks to the, all the world, all the works, all the things that God has made, and he's like, yeah, have you seen? Have you seen how good our God is? Have you seen what he's given us in Jesus Christ? He's like, oh, everything, everywhere, you ought to bless the Lord. And then he moves right back down to his own soul, right back down to himself, and he says, you soul, you soul, don't forget his benefits. Don't forget his fatherly love. Don't forget that he's removed your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. Don't forget that your weaknesses actually draw out his compassion. Don't forget that you have been anchored into an everlasting love and into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And soul, when those truths hit you, it's time to bless the Lord. It's time to worship. It's time to exalt in the one who is the best the greatest. True Christianity is consuming worship of God in response to compelling grace from God. In true Christianity, we give God everything because he's already given us everything. We gladly put everything down to follow Jesus because the inheritance that he's promised us will so far out exceed anything we could have imagined. This, guys, this, this is true Christianity. Let's pray. Lord, we all came in here this morning needing to have the subject of our lives changed, needing for you to change the channel, needing for the noise, the crazy, our sins, our weaknesses, for all that gets in the way. What we need is for that to just pass away. And God, you have met us here and you've proclaimed the most wonderful things. God, we look to you this morning as this wonderful Father who is rich in mercy, slow to anger, who doesn't deal with us according to our sins. And we can't help but just want to worship you, want to exalt you, want to lift you up because you are worthy. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.